What is shaking, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Wind Up Podcast. I am your host, Mike, of MTGA Wines, and as promised, if you listened to last week's Q&A at the end of July, you know full well what we are in for today. We are going to get into the trials and tribulations of being in the hospitality industry, in Napa specifically, but this applies to any restaurant, any hospitality industry, hotels, restaurants, wineries, tour companies, whatever the case may be. There are so many crazy things that happen in this industry. We very jokingly, this is something that many of you maybe don't know, is that for those of us that host guests regularly, that entertain people regularly, whether it's been for yourself and your own business or people you've worked for, there's kind of this running joke, somewhat serious joke, that we just can't stand people at a certain point. It's kind of weird because you're like, oh, you work in hospitality, you must love entertaining and doing all these things. And like, yeah, we do, but we just hate people. And it's, it's kind of funny that way, but the reason why we have that little undertone to what we do sometimes is because of the stories I'm going to tell you today. And it's going to start a little bit more on the mild side, and I'll get into some more kind of fun ones in general. But I'm going to start with this, that if you've read, if you've seen the movie Waiting, if you've read Kitchen Confidential, or if you're watching The Bear right now, all three of those are way more accurate than you will probably realize. In fact, I mean, Kitchen Confidential is... It's so funny because we had a friend of ours, this was probably sometime last year, that read it for the first time. She works in healthcare. She's kind of outside of the hospitality industry, but deals with people all the time. But she, her question was like, is this really what the restaurant industry was like? You know, in this era that Bourdain was doing his thing, we're like, was? It still is like that. It hasn't changed all that much. There might be a little bit less cocaine in the kitchens, but realistically, it's probably still there. So let's start with that. And for those of us that have worked in hospitality, watching The Bear and this this new series on Hulu, I think it's on Hulu, uh, you're watching it and it's a little bit of like, not PTSD is a little strong, but you watch and you get these like gut punches of, oh, that was me that one day in this spot. And you're just, oh, it's so brutal to watch. I, like, I full-on have friends in the hospitality industry that have watched episodes and are simply like, I'm not watching this show anymore because it just brings back too many horror story memories of working in kitchens and around restaurants and in hospitality. So, and the show, the movie Waiting is obviously a lot of like satire and like here's this shit show of a restaurant crew that really truly like hate people, but they all work in this restaurant and kind of commiserate together. That's kind of what that undertone of the hospitality industry I mentioned is it's basically that it's like we do this to pay our bills and many people like myself we do really really enjoy it but there are moments where you're just like I hate everybody I just hate everybody today and uh, hopefully these stories that I'm about to tell you will illustrate that a little bit now to give you a touch of background I I started working in the hospitality industry when I was 14 years old Uh, This was, I literally, you turn 14, and in California, that's when you can get a job legally. So that's when my folks took me down to the local catering company and said, hey, our son needs a job, put him to work. And they said, great, he's hired. It was literally that simple. And at that stage, I was a schlep, which is, it was the very, you know, kind of term for a service helper, schlep. And my job for a couple of years was basically cutting bread and butter and scraping plates into trash cans. That was it. Every once in a while I'd help start a fire for grilling and like warm up plates and ovens for the chefs so that we could do service on warm plates and things like that. It was like the the menial task, bottom of the barrel, like low man on the totem pole, whatever turn of phrase you want to use. But we still found ways to have fun. Because you're all you're you're kind of with working with your friends, you you know you're all kids growing small small town kids growing up all working for the same caterer. You have a couple people that are you know in cl- a class ahead or two of you who are the service staff. So it's kind of this weird incestuous vibe you know within this company. 
and we do stupid stuff. There's like one winery in particular, like we would go through the back door uh, to, you know, get things set up. There's a kitchen like into the left. There's the like, barrel room off to the right. And like we would set up the grill outside and we would have our little service station where we'd be cutting bread and butter and scraping plates like right by that back door. And as a service, as a schlep, there was always like this downtime in between service and like the servers actually doing their job and then we would like refill bread and like water pitchers every once in a while so there wasn't a lot to do for like this period of time and when we got bored and apparently this was something that was happening long before i started there but we would get bored and since we have access to butter and spatulas we would see how many sticks of butter we could get to stick to the ceiling before we left you know, because reasons. You know, we always had too much butter. We're like, we're bored. You can see there's already four up there from the last time we were here, so let's see if we can get four more up there. And that's the kind of shit we would do. You know, very harmless, good fun. Never got in trouble for it, allegedly. In fact, this is all of this is allegedly. None of this may, this, all of this may or may not have happened. It definitely did. Uh, so it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, you're just kind of a shithead teenager. You're screwing about, you're throwing butter on the ceiling, whatever. Harmless fun, right? Good, harmless fun. And then you get to the point where you kind of work your way up the food chain. I eventually became a server, which was a lot of fun. I definitely got yelled at a couple of times because I like served, served you know, like in a, in a bowl that was like cracked versus like the one that needed to be out on a buffet. Uh, there was something else. What was it? It had to do with like something I did with like the oven or like I heated up the plates like way too hot because we'd wrap like the plates in foil for the main course if we we're doing you know coursed out service that way we were there nice and warm and I think I just had the oven on too hot so all of these plates were like scalding like you couldn't hold them so people like wrapping their hands in towels and napkins so that we could try and just get these out of the kitchen and onto people's table and we would it was just a nightmare like little stuff like that, and you just you get chewed out for stuff like that. But it's kind of like that scene from the end of Inglorious Bastards. He's like, it's like you'll be shot for this. And he's like, nah, nah, not shot. I'll 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 be chewed out, but I've been chewed out before. It's kind of that. <laughs> it's kind of that. It's like I'll be it'll be fine. Yeah, I'll, I'm in trouble, but eh, we'll be all right. And then you have things like I think this was my second or last uh, event that I worked for this company because I was heading off to college. And it's at Hans Faden Winery, uh, which is on Petrified Forest Road. If you're going from Calistoga over towards Santa Rosa, it's a wedding, uh, beautiful wedding. It was, it was a lot of fun. And we're doing, we're serving champagne for the champagne toast. And we're walking around and, and the tables are kind of like up against the cave wall. So you kind of have to like shimmy your way around. And if you have a tray of like eight or 12 champagne glasses, like it's kind of unnerving, right? Because you got all the stuff that could just like fall. So you got to be pretty steady handed. And I'm at this table trying to get this champagne down. I give it to this gal next to her, I think is her husband or boyfriend, you know, they're attending the wedding. Uh, and he's in full dress, like blues, like marine, like, like to the nines, right? Like all dialed in. And I go, like I get the champagne, you know, serve from the left, ladies first, give that to her. And I have to like take a step back and go back and around him. And as I'm going around him, he adjusts his chair like you do. You sit down, you got to give it a little shake, a little shimmy. And it just happens to catch me a little bit. And that entire tray of champagne went into his lap. And I don't know if you've ever seen, those of you in the military probably have seen this or like work in and around the military have seen this, but I had not at this stage in my life. When you see a Marine that's like really super mad at you, it's a little bit intimidating and actually he just sat there quiet like he immediately went into like a like breathing exercise to try and relax like you saw the switch flip of like I, this is fine i'm gonna sit here i'm not gonna do a damn thing his wife girlfriend whatever laid into me she she was really pissed and i'm like i'm so sorry went grabbed him towels we picked up the dry cleaning luckily it was champagne and not red wine could you imagine if i dumped a bunch of red wine on this guy i'd probably be dead right now and and you know and my boss at the time is like listen you're not allowed on the floor for the rest of the night because if they see you he might not take your head off but she will she is up in arms about what you just did so you are back to the low man on the totem pole you're scraping plates tonight for what you did so 
some of that stuff, you, you know, it is what it is. But those are like the, the like the issues, I guess, that we deal with and kind of the shenanigans that we deal with when it comes to like service and hospitality. And this is like the first few years of me like working just in general, right? Like pretty tame stories, actually, all in all. For Like I got to preface the rest of this with everything I'm telling you is actually pretty tame. There are far crazier stories. And you talk to anyone who's worked in fine dining, restaurants in general, hospitality, everyone's got a laundry list of stories like this. And I actually feel like, like I got some pretty good ones, but they're nothing like other. These are you know, just solid shenanigans and kind of, you know, screw ups basically, right? So as time goes on, you know, I, I go to college, I come back and I start working in tasting rooms and doing hospitality stuff again. And it just, it, it can kind of continues to happen. Like you just have these moments where something goes awry or you're having a day and it just, this stuff snowballs on you so fast. And that's when, and we, we like for us, for some of us in the industry, we just call it gen pop, almost like, like, you know, prison talk. It's like, no, the general population is just awful. And now we have to deal with them on like a regular basis because we're, you know, if you're working for that big, like open to the public cattle call kind of winery, like I've done, you deal with some people that are just truly awful a lot. And the vast majority of people are amazing, right? Like it's, it's not that hard to be a good human, and most people, I think, are. I'm, I try to be an optimist in that way, but we all know the shitheads that are out there, right? That's painfully obvious. If you've been on social media at all in the last 10 years, like, you've seen them, right? That's how it works. But back in the day, you would just have to experience that firsthand. You know, you were no longer a screen and internet removed from them. You are it up in the business, and you had to deal with it, and it was not the most fun. And from there, from like my easygoing, like just shenanigans with a catering company, starting to work for the wine industry and in tasting rooms is where it really started to ramp up. Now, which makes sense because you get alcohol involved and people get fired up and so on and so forth. So the first, the first thing that was like a true like test of my patience when it came to hospitality was um, I was working for uh, this large winery just outside of St. Helena and there was a group that would come in from the wine train. And those, many of you know the wine train that runs up and down the valley. They, they have a couple of stops. And this was kind of as they were ramping up that program. There'd be a couple of stops. A bunch of people would get on a bus and then come to us. And it was usually groups of like 10 to 25 people. And everyone at the winery hated dealing with them because nine times out of 10, they had had lunch on the train. They'd been drinking for like three hours already. And they got to us, and it was just a complete shit show. Just an absolute mess. I was the new kid on the block. Again, kind of low man on the totem pole. And I said, listen, no one likes dealing with these. Let me see if I can deal with them. Like, give me every one of these tours you can, and I'll just deal with it. No one else, I'm, I'll, take, I'll take this bullet for everybody. And then part of it was just the challenge of dealing with that crowd and learning how to sell wine to those folks. But also frankly, they were kind of fun because they were already loosened up and lively and I could just kind of talk trash and hang out. Like it was, they were actually very easy groups once you kind of found out what the vibe of the group was. But every once in a while, you'd have that lady who doesn't really like wine, but loves really, really sweet wine. And during lunch, she would drink a bottle of port by herself and show up and like her husband is literally like carrying her around the wine range. She's like, I just want a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. I'm like, there's, this is water, but it's the best Sauvignon Blanc you're going to have today. Yeah. She, uh, she was not doing too hot. She could not even stand. Like it was full on like band of brothers, like arm over her husband's shoulder, like being carried around the winery. It was bad. And you just, you have to be like, Hey man, like you need to take her like, here's here's a pitcher of water go sit in the lobby and just take care of her like don't do not do not try to go on this tour and you have and and of course like no no she'll be fine she'll be fine I'm like she's not fine she's not even awake right now you need to you need to go take care of her get her out of here then you'd have other folks who are just hammered up to be a little frisky and they would kick it they would you know with these big groups you can't always you can try and keep a pretty good head count and know where everybody's at like we do have our ways of doing that 
But every once in a while, you'd be like, we're short a couple of people. And those couple of people would just be banging in the bathroom. You'd have to go in there, knock on the door, and be like, hey, we know what's happening. Wrap it up. Hopefully, you wrapped it up. And two, you got to get out of here. Like, it's time to finish and hit the road, Jack. The rest of the group's out front. You need to leave. That happened more times than I can count of people just trying to have sex in the winery. It was so obnoxious. The amount, the amount of underwear that we found around the winery on a regular basis was kind of absurd. I don't know how and where these people were coming from and what inspired them to just get after it like bunny rabbits in the cellar. But hey, it happened all the time, all the time. And it, it, as someone in hospitality, you're just like, well... Break out the hazmat suit and rubber gloves. We had to grab the bleach and clean this thing, you know, this area, because who knows what the hell they were doing over here. It was it was not, not good. Not good at all. There was one in particular where it was like a big party and event. Those that, that That's where it tended to happen more often. And it was like people were like going in and out of the bathroom, and they were like telling us, like, by the way, these two are like getting after it. Like, it's, it's borderline, like, like they're, they're, throwing down in in the ladies restroom and I, our gm at the time had to walk in there and be like guys you gotta stop you gotta stop like you're this is you're you're everyone knows like you stop stop screaming like i'm i'm happy for you i'm great that great that you're having a good time maybe take it back to the hotel room where you can just really bang the headboard against the wall like this is not the place to be doing that like those are the conversations you have it's just absolutely bonkers absolutely bonkers and I'm pretty sure that almost every person who's worked in hospitality has to deal with that situation where people just decide to, you know, bang it out. The drunk lady who's just about to pass out, that's something that everybody deals with in some way, shape, or form. And a bartender, restaurant, winery, whatever, like we've all dealt with that before. Where someone's like asleep in their food at the table. That happens. It's absolutely crazy. But let's get to the good stuff, right? We t like this is like the normal day-to-day. -day. That's just the normal stuff. Dealing, pe dealing with drunk idiots, dealing with, you know, people having sex somewhere on the property, spilling wine on people, you know, throwing butter on ceilings. That's just the good, good old wholesome fun that the hospitality ha industry has to offer you when you sign up for it. One of my favorites, though, when I was working behind that tasting bar, speaking of drunk idiots, this was, this one was pretty good. And... This lady comes, I mean, bat out of hell through the front doors, around to my far end of the bar. I was like, state. we had like stations. I was at this one station. I'm hanging out there. She walks up to me. She said there are a couple of friends of hers in tow. And she's pretty lit up. Like, she's feeling good. She's having a great day. And her friends are, basically her friends, for those that are watching the YouTube video, they're like, mm. they They basically do the hand across the throat like she's cut off, like she's toast. Like, don't. Do what you can, but don't serve her anymore. She's fine. And I go, got it. Nice. And she walks up to me. She looks me dead in the eyes and goes, Hi, my name is, can't even remember what her name is, but my name is this. I like Chardonnay, Blue Eyes, and at the last winery, they signed my chest, so you have to sign my back. And then pulls down the front of her shirt. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure enough, there's a signature there. So I'm like, let me get you a little bit of white wine. I pull a carafe of water and a glass, and I pour it, like, so she can't see what I'm pouring. I'm like, here's some Sauv Blanc. Tell her friends, it's water. Don't tell her. And she takes one sip. She's like, oh, this is so refreshing. Thank you so much. I'm like, you're welcome. Have a great day. So the tasting continues. I chat with her friend. She's kind of like in her own world, just hanging out, enjoying her glass of water <laughs> that she is convinced is Sauvignon Blanc. One of the funniest things. And... It comes to the end of the tasting, and I figure, all right, she's she's a little hammered. We got her some water. She's probably feeling good, but she's going to drop the, you got to sign a body part thing, right? Nope, sure as hell not. She comes right back. She's like, we're leaving. You still need to sign my back. And I go, are you sure? And she is, and she's like, yes, you have to. This guy signed my chest. You got to sign my back. I go, all right, I'll be right back. Let me go get a pen. Because I'm that guy that goes, all right, if this is happening, I'm getting the biggest, baddest, indelible space marker on the property. You know, like those really big Sharpies, like the Sharpies that are, you know, not your normal ones. Actually, I'm holding one in my hand right now because I need something to fidget with while I talk. So it's not like the normal Sharpie. It's like the big, thick ones, right? Where it's like you could 
you pop the top off of that and you're high off that pen for days, kind of a space marker, right? I get one of those bad boys and I go, all right, lift up shirt, turn around. And I don't think her friends noticed this because they were kind of like on their way out the door. But there were a few other people at the bar who were like, this isn't happening right now, is it? And then I'm just like, oh, yeah, this is happening. And I take that big ass marker and I just go all the way across. I mean, it is like, like think of like John Hancock, but on somebody's back, right? Like it's, I go for it. Like we go for the size and, and try and cover, you know, the whole back. Because I want her to be at the pool the next day with her husband and be like, what the hell happened to you yesterday? <laughs> Again, good harmless fun. She wanted, she hey, listen, she wanted an autograph. I gave it to her. She specified where. I made sure she was okay with it. Things happen. I don't know the rest of that story, but I'm sure her friends and whoever her significant other was had a lovely time explaining why she had Sharpie all over her the next day outstanding see good harmless wholesome fun that's what we do in the hospitality industry but this is where it starts to take a little bit of a turn because that's the kind of like like i said drunk idiots you're just dealing with the general population and they're tying it on you kind of have to you can't have too much fun because you don't want to make anyone mad right but you at the same time i need to be entertained too and when you're a shithead teenager or in your early 20s this is the kind of bullshit you do. Now that started to shift when at this same winery, I was the interim tasting room manager for, for a little while. And at that stage, you know, you, you have a little bit more responsibility. I was still kind of a shithead in my early 20s. And, and we had these two tasting bars, one like right at the front of the winery, one at the cellar. It's kind of a busy day, so we got both of them going. And this bus pulls up. And I go, shit, okay, and it's, it's like a big bus, like the 55 person like passenger buses, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a conference coming in. They're not on the schedule, they don't have an appointment. Keep in mind this winery is just open to the public so anyone can show up at any time. But if it's a group of like 30 or 40, that's a different conversation, right? So I, I tell all my staff, I'm like, hey, you guys take this bar, you take this bar. We're gonna try and put all of these, the cellar's a little slow right now, so we're gonna try and push every one of these people into the cellar anyone else coming through the door they're going to the front that way we can like manage this because there's no way these folks are coming into this building sober it's it's in the afternoon they're on a giant bus there's definitely at least a cooler on that bus and sure enough every one of these people and i mean almost every one of these people walk in with like a coors light or a bud light or something in their hand like there's just beer cans everywhere immediately within in the winery which is totally verboten like that's not okay and we will kick your ass out. But if you've ever been one person trying to wrangle like 40 drunk asshats, it doesn't necessarily go well. So as soon as that starts happening, I go back to my team and I say, okay, if anyone is remotely hammered, I mean slurs even a little bit or like, you know, does the wave a little bit while they stand, they're cut off, they're done, give them some water and be like, hey, you're welcome to hang out, but we can't serve you just start cutting people off left and right. So that's what they start doing because all these people were atrocious. I grab a couple of extra people. We start cleaning up the beer cans and tidying things up. And I'm trying to hunt down like who's in charge, like whose group is this? Where'd they come from? Is there a ringleader of some sort or is it just a mess? Because we're trying to like control this situation and it gets volatile really fast. I mean, this, this happens within the span of like a couple of minutes. It, it's kind of fast and furious. And even the, like the driver comes in and he's and he's like asking about like Wi-Fi or something. And I'm like, dude, no, who are you? Where are these people from? I need your contact information because I'm calling your boss because this is bullshit. The whole like we're trying to sort this out. And by the time we get things kind of remotely tidied up, I'm going back to like support my team. And these three Broduskis, you know, show up. They they look like frat boys. And they just you know douchebag frat boys that's the only way i can put it and we're walking down this hallway which there's like the bat it's where the bathrooms are and it's kind of this narrow hallway that goes from the front of the winery to the cellar where we kind of cordoned all them off and it's basically the like hey you're in charge here i say yes i'm the manager on site today and this dude lays into me 
and he it basically and I'll paraphrase but it's like basically this is bullshit we're being cut off we're here to give you business how dare you it just kind of goes on and on and on and on and his he, it's like him and then his two buddies behind him so it's like the it's like I don't know if they're trying to play a like good cop bad cop his buddies seem a little more sober than he is like a little bit more prone to being rational but they don't say anything they just stand there and I go well listen here's the deal I have to stand by my staff if they think you've been overserved today, I gotta, you know, you're welcome to have a glass of water, kick back, relax, hang out with your friends, but we just can't serve you. That I have to stand by that. And also, by the way, like you guys walked in with like a bunch of beer cans. We've been trying to clean that up. Like that's not cool. Like we're we're trying to pick up the pieces here. I was being I, being so green at like managing situations like this. I would I definitely gave them too many concessions. But given that he's already in my face, I'm like, we're just, I'm just trying, this is how you deal with these issues, is you try and de-escalate. Because it's easy to ramp people up, and once they're ramped up, that's when you get punches thrown at you. So it's all about trying to manage the situation and de-escalate. That's, that's all I'm trying to do. And that's why I kind of give him some concessions. And I, and I get through kind of explaining the situation that, hey, I mean, realistically, we're going to need you guys to leave because we can't have these beers here. Like, you can't just bring in, like, we can get shut down for this. Like, this is a huge issue. And th at that point, I probably shouldn't have said that, but he that's when he literally shoves me up against the wall and gets, like, right up in my face. And his two buddies adjust so they're still, like, right behind me. And that's when he lay, you know, just tees off even more. Kind of same, same. But he also pulls out the, do you know who I am? My father's this lawyer. This is discrimination. Keep in mind, this is like the whitest of white dudes in like a polo shirt, pleated shorts, and like boat shoes. Like, calm down, home slice. Like, relax. And goes in even further. I'm like, listen, this is the situation. I've already told you what, what's happening. If you don't like that, we can call the sheriff... And he can decide what we should do next. Probably not the right thing to say. But as soon as I break out the word sheriff, it's like his two buddies came to and were like, you know what, let's, let, there, let's go back in the cellar. We'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. It's all good. Like, no harm, no foul. We'll go talk about it. And he's like, okay, yeah, I threatened to call the cops. Of course you're going to calm down. But that's like, that's like, okay, that's the assault version of dealing with drunk assholes like all of a sudden you get shoved up against the wall there's one dude in your face with two more behind him and you're trying to say hey i gotta kick you out i'm not exactly like i'm tall but i'm not exactly the biggest dude i'm also a lover not a fighter i've never been in a fight in my life and i was not about to start that day so that was just i, I stand there in the hallway after they go and i'm like what the what is going on like what is happening today so i go into the cellar i talk to uh, the gentleman who's kind of managing that bar, I'm like, how are you holding up? He's like, we had to cut off almost everybody. Like they're like, we're giving them water. We're pouring. And I say, all right, for anyone who's tasting short pour them, get them out of here. Like they need to move. And, I, and when we say short pour, like typically our pouring, you know, depending on the winery, they'll pour like a, a two ounces or so. I'm like half an ounce. We're talking like a sip and then get them the hell out of here. And shortly after that, like another 10 minutes later, these three Brodewskis who were in my face were like, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you taking care of us. This is the best. Everyone's having a great time. I'm like, what is going on here? This is the, what, you just shoved me against the wall. I should call the cops. In fact, I, I realistically, I should have. But whatever. It is what it is. We got through it. And, and they all leave. And this couple comes up to me at the very end. They're like, listen. We're so sorry. This was our idea to come here because we serve this wine at our wedding. And it was so important for us to come here and see the place because we love the wine. It was such a big part of our day and we needed to be here. We joined the club. We bought a bunch of wine. I'm like, you couldn't have just started. You couldn't have just like opened with that. We went through this like half hour of hell trying to deal with all this tomfoolery. And now you tell me this. Ugh. Because we could have, we probably, no, there was actually, like, looking back, I keep trying to convince myself that there was an okay way to handle it, given the context of the day, and even then, I'm like, no, there's no way that I did that correctly, is what it is, but here we are. Survived the tell tell tale got shoved against a wall, but no punches were thrown, and we got them the hell out of there uh, before they caused any more problems. That was That was a rough day.
that was a rough day for yeah for those that you know don't know when when a customer starts pushing and shoving you that's typically a bad thing yeah yeah interestingly enough this same property i have a lot of stories but a lot of them like the, like that's kind of like the run of the mill dealing with drunk people like stories the really interesting stuff happens like during like the big parties and events because this same winery would throw outrageous parties. Like there was one that was always like Mardi Gras themed that was just an absolute mess every year or every other year, however often they used to do it. You know, they, there was one point where they had hired like models to walk around to like serve dessert, like chocolates from this really great chocolate shop down in Yonville. And they had the chocolatier like who did all that paint these models like in white or dark chocolate. It's literally people walking around covered in chocolate. And you can imagine that if you're going late into the evening with a bunch of drunk people and there's just people covered in chocolate, like pretty girls walking around with chocolate covered on them, bad things happen. Like you see, you saw people start to like lick their finger and touch them. You saw people like actually like lick their shoulders and like try, it was, it was, it got really weird, really fast. And, and I like, I, it was that point where it's like, we need to get you ladies off the floor because this is going to be a problem. It's already a problem. And if it, there, if something got swept under the rug after that because of a, com, a, a harassment complaint, I would not be surprised. It was bad. Like it was one of those situations at this party where it's like, this is a little ostentatious. This is a little bit out there. This is kind of crazy. And then when the drunk old dude started licking the hot models, it was like, okay, no, like this is, this is bad. We like, we got to get the hell out of here. Like you need to leave. And just get off the floor, go change. There's a, a guest house with a shower. Go take care. Go do whatever you got to do. And then please don't, uh, like, I don't know. I Luckily, I was not in charge of that department. That was not my problem. I was just a photographer and videographer. That, so I, I just, I got to just literally see it through this lens. But it was a hot mess. But those were also the parties where, like, going back to, like, finding underwear in random places, like, in the tasting room, in the cellar, in the bathroom. I mean, people were just, for some reason, people let loose. And at that party in particular, in, in those years, it just was a free-for-all, just an absolute disaster. And, and one of my favorite stories to come out of that party in particular was we had, um, I got to be careful with this because it involves some fairly high-powered people. Um, but... See, this is the juicy stuff. Like, I can't, if you know, some of you who who we've met and tasted, like, you know where I've worked over the course of my career in the wine industry. It's not that hard to figure this out, but I'm not going to say it on the record. This is all allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I know there's some lawyers out there listening. Allegedly is where it's at. My favorite word in the English language. Also, like, liberated. Like, we didn't, like, these pint glasses weren't stolen from the bar. They were liberated. <laughs> The good stuff. That probably still doesn't fly in court, but whatever. It's funny. So we're cleaning up after this party. And, you know, for us in the hospitality world, you know, we're getting done at 2, 3 in the morning. We got to be back the next morning at like 7 or 8 to continue cleaning up and, you know, resetting for the next day. And one of the guests, uh, one of the esteemed guests of the evening actually shows up pretty early as we are setting up, which was kind of weird. I mean, it happened every once in a while that someone would show up the next day because they left a purse or sunglasses or a jacket and they would come back and pick it up. And we'd have like our lost and found, you know, to try and iron all that out. But this individual came in and was very specifically asking for a, a medicine bag. We we're like, oh, I was, we we're like, oh, and we assume like, oh, she must be like diabetic or something of that nature. Um, so we go through the lost and found, there's nothing there. And she's like, oh, well, I was, Shoot, I got to bleep that out. You're going to hear a bleep right there because I can't say that because you'll know what I'm talking about. So if you heard the bleep, that's my bad. I had to bleep that out or a cut of some sort. My bad. I got excited. So I left it in this room. I left this medicine bag in this room. Let me go look for it. She goes back there. Can't find it. We can't find anything. So we're like, well, we'll let you know if and it, but she was very like nondescript on like what it was like there wasn't like a description of the bag there wasn't a hey it's this brand or anything it was just a medicine bag we're like okay that's kind of weird so she leaves and and we are continuing to clean up and this colleague of mine who's cleaning up that particular space was like hey 
I think I found it. And then pulls out a Ziploc bag that does like the like roll down. And there's just a nice fine white powder in it. And we were like, medicine bag. Got it. Cool. And everyone's like, well, that's not sugar you're going to put in your coffee. And But he's like, well, and then someone's like, is that what I think it is? You know, something along those lines. And he's like, hold on. It like does like the 80s like cop movie thing. He pops open the bag, licks a finger, dips his finger in said bag into powdery white substance. And for those of you that aren't watching, I'm rubbing my finger on my gums. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's cocaine. And then closes up the bag and like rolls it back up. And we're like, what? What are you? What are you do? What? What are you doing right now? This isn't like some buddy cop movie. Like, th- number one, you got to get rid of that, or you better share, at the very least, please. That's the nice thing to do. Bring some for the whole class, you know. And you realize, you know, like you go back and flash back to that night, and you remember who was like hanging out in that space and like what was going on, like. That makes sense. They were really amped up for 3 o'clock in the morning. Now I get it. That that checks out. That checks out. And there, like, there are other things where it's like you hang out with cl- clients uh, for another one of the properties that I manage. You're hanging out with clients. They're like, you got to come drink with us. You're like, I'm at work. I can't, I can't hang out with you. They're like, we're playing Cards Against Humanity. And I remember this. There's one couple who we became good friends after the fact. But we're sitting around a fire pit playing cards against humanity, and, and I'm just enough of, of a sarcastic asshole that I kind of go for shock factor when playing that particular game. And I tell him, like, by the way, you're going to hate me after this. You're going to ask me to leave because I'm going to find the most absurd matches. And sure enough, I did. And that's how we became good friends because they were just absurd as I was, which is great. So you do have those, like, shining star moments where you're like, oh, we made friends now. This is exciting. And then you have the, like, oh, no, we found your drugs in this room, but... We're keeping them. Thanks. Thanks for playing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, and that's just the winery side of it. That's just the winery experiences. Now you talk about like the restaurant side of things, like what you see in the bear. Like, like the only thing I have, because I, ne- I never worked in the back end of like a high-end restaurant. It was always like catering gigs and stuff like that. But I remember some of you, and this restaurant's closed, so I don't mind talking about about it and letting know letting you know the name of it. But Red. Uh, in Yontville. Uh, it was uh, Richard Reddington, who was the sh- executive chef there, um, famously known t- to have a bit of a temper in the kitchen. And it was one of those things that you would sit down at the bar. They had like the best chicken wings. Oh, they were so good. But you'd sit there and we knew the bartenders and we'd hang out. It was just, and I was living in Yontville at the time. So it was just, it was a great spot to go for like a bite and a drink and then like kick it. But every once in a while, you would hear him tee off in the kitchen and you would hear a plate like whiz through the air and clang against something. He's going off at somebody. We're all, and we look at the bartender and he's like, yeah, he's having a bit of a day. Like totally normal, like to just get plates thrown at your head. Meanwhile, there's like guests at the bar who don't know this and are just like, what is happening back there? Like it's someone dropped something. It's fine. Don't worry. Here's, can I get you another cocktail? What do you need? And it's this, this glimpse into the industry that is just absolutely absurd. And then, you know, especially during that time in Yontville, that was when Poncha's, this Hell's Angels bar was still open. And we would go hang out there afterwards for like a cheap shot and a beer. And it's just all these industry people, whether it was us in the tasting rooms and sales side of things, whether it was the chefs and restaurateurs, the Hell's Angels would show up from time to time. I sung happy birthday to those guys. Really nice, actually. Very nice guys. Uh, And... You would just kind of commiserate about these shit show experiences where you got a plate thrown at your head today or this customer shoved you against the wall or this lady was puking sick and you had to try and like figure it out. Like there was so much absolute nonsense and that's just the way this industry is, man. Every, every year we get new stories to tell people because of this kind of stuff. It's just... Oh my gosh, it is just absolutely bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers. And as much as we commiserate about dealing with the general population, the reason we keep coming back is because we love what we do. It's the honest-to-goodness truth. It's a chore sometimes, but damn it, if nothing else, you get some badass stories and some really fun stories out of it that... I don't think there's another industry that 
can do that for you. It's pretty amazing. Pretty damn amazing. All right. I forgot to grab my bottle of wine that was my wine of the week this week. And this is something that I've... This one's a little bit biased because it's a family a family wine. But it's something that I've been opening more and more recently because I just love where it's at. Uh, but it's the 2001 uh, Con Valley Vineyards Right Bank. Uh, I don't really tie, I try not to cross the streams between what I do and the family stuff. I like, we, we like kind of keeping it, you know, separation of church and state, so to speak. But this is a wine that tugs on some heartstrings because it was the first year that they made the Right Bank blend. And forever, it's been my favorite wine that Con Valley has produced. Uh, this wine was made specifically by Max Sawyer, who, was, who signed on in 2001, um, whose history was at the likes of Chateau Cheval Blanc in Bordeaux. Uh, he joined uh, the team at Con Valley Vineyards specifically to make that style of blend, where it's Cab Franc, Merlot heavy, and run with it. So Right Bank has been the name since 2001. Uh, that was his first vintage of it. And unfortunately, he passed away, uh, I think it would have been like 2012, very suddenly. It was, yeah, 2000, I think, yeah, 2012. And, you know, for that 11 years, you know, 10 years of making wine at Con Valley, the right bank was, I think, he, he always did a great job with the wines, but I think the right bank was really like his baby because that's what he was brought in to, in to do. And to this day, it's still probably my favorite wine that comes out of that production. Uh, because I, you guys know me, I'm a big Merlot fan in general. And then Cab Franc, ugh, I adore it. And it's one of those wines that we talk so much about wines aging and getting better with time. And now that it's 20 plus years old, it's still just singing. Like it's showing no signs of slowing down. And it's something that even if you're buying the, the newer releases, the current releases, it's something that is just, it'll treat you right no matter what. So obviously I'm very, very biased, but I had a bottle of that old vintage this last week. And I got to tell you, it's, if, if you know about Con Valley Vineyards and you've enjoyed those wines before and, or maybe haven't tried them in a while, uh, the right bank's always where it's at. It'll never steer you wrong. So uh, 2001 Anderson's Con Valley Vineyards, right bank. Again, I'm a little biased, but damn it, that juice is really tasty right now. So thank you so much for tuning on in. I really appreciate it. Hopefully those stories gave you a little insight into the day-to-day -day operations of what we do between catering, retail, restaurant, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And remember, that sh this, those three things between Kitchen Confidential, Waiting, and The Bear, way, way, way more accurate than you might give them credit for. So keep that in mind if you're trucking through that book or watching that show or that movie. It's, it'll blow your mind. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, we'll catch you later.